side of the world uh, in California, so hopefully the sound is alright, um, and uh, the idea is that Tobias will do a 20 minute lecture, and then after that we have a Q&A session for about 10 minutes, and uh, if uh, you have a question, you raise your hand, and you come down to the screen and uh, formulate the question in front of the screen, because otherwise Tobias will not be able to hear you. So uh, Tobias, did you hear all that? Yeah, I uh, Cool, this so you. the floor is yours. Great, thank you very much, Alka. Um So, I've got about 20 minutes to give you a look of an insight into how we generate insights that I do. And um, obviously, 20 minutes is not enough for the full lecture on insights. So, I've, I've, I've named it. We can go into insights, and uh, I've selected a few of my favorite methods of getting quick um, knowledge around users. So, yeah, what what is what's insight? What are insights? It's basically an understanding of um, the people that you're designing for, the people you're working with, and um, it might be their values, it might be the way they. Uh, it might be um, the reasons they do things they do them, um, the way they do them. And uh, it might be just generally who they are, what they feel, and what they think. Um, so looking at this photo of this guy, you might already just by looking at the photo, you might be getting ideas of who he is, what he's doing, why is he doing that, and um, what does he get out of it. Um, I don't know, I just um, so, Jakob already said a bit about who I am. Um, Danish, I studied with Jakob a few years ago. I have a master's in engineering from DTU and I have an MA in interaction design from Copenhagen to the interaction design. And um, through an internship with IBO, I ended up full time over here in California. And uh, on my day to day job, I design interfaces. I design usually is to do interfaces, uh, but also to do machine interfaces. And uh, one of the, the important things about IDEO here is that we never design anything without grounding it in insights and knowledge about the people we're designing for. Um, so I always, I always start projects going out into the field, talking to people, observing, and, um, and learning about the people um, I'm designing for, and it's about basically creating empathy um, with the designers for the people. Um, so, just short about IDEO, we're a human centered design consultancy. We, um, we have about 550 employees, and we have offices pretty much all over the world. Um, and we've been around for a long time, and, and we were kind of a company that pioneered the whole human centered design thinking back in the 90s. Um, so we have a lot of internal methods and we have a lot of internal names for the same thing. Basically, um, what we, what some people call insight um, is also known as design research, user research, human practice research, insights gathering, strategic planning, or consumer insights, and lots of other different names for the same thing. And I don't really know what to call it. And Usually, I call it human practice research or user research, but it really depends on the type of project and the type of activities we're doing. Um, so yeah, you can you can come up with your own name or you can take whatever you, you feel appropriate. Um, but basically, it all covers the same area. It is the technique that we use to ground design human needs, behaviors, and culture, and that's a very broad thing. So what does that mean? Um, from IDEO's perspective, it means that it is the why behind the what, so why are people doing what they're doing? Um, for the designers here, the idea is a new way of seeing things. It's seeing things through the lens of other people. So 
doing that, that increases the, the awareness from the designer's perspective around the thing you're designing for. It might not be if thinking that you can relate to personally, but you will after doing some of this research. Um, traditionally, market research has been very uh, quantitative, basically. And um, one of the things we do here is that it's very socially constructed, um, our use of research. And it's, of course, working as fuel for innovation and idea generation, and then it is the foundation for our design process here at IDEA. Um, that doesn't mean we don't do other things, and traditional market research can be complementary to human research. Um, we don't do it that often, traditional market research, but we do it sometimes when we feel appropriate, and it, it kind of depends on the size of the project and, and the type of client as well. Um, this slide is kind of showing the, the differences between traditional market research and human factors research. So, at traditional market research, you often see that it's focused on improving existing things. It's about incremental development. And um, human practice research is more focused on inspiring new ideas. So often when we start out doing human practice research, we don't know what we're looking for. And, um, and that generally is what happens most of the idea. The client comes in with a question, and the first thing we ask ourselves is, is that the right question? The classic quote goes that um, if the client comes in and asks for a toaster, then you should start thinking about how to heat up bread. Um, traditional market research also focuses on explicit needs often, and you try to identify specific needs of the customer. Um, human factors research is more about uncovering latent needs. It's about uncovering needs we didn't know existed and maybe the user didn't even know it existed. Um, traditional market research is talking about um, using controlled settings. So with the controlled settings, say you're using a survey, or you are using, say you're getting feedback on the prototype, and you're using a, uh, a traditional kind of usability lab with a one-way mirror, or you might be having a focus group and you're all sitting around a conference table talking about some topic. Um, human practice research will always go about and visit people in the natural context. Um, so either at their home or we go to their workplace or somewhere else where it really makes sense to meet them. We don't take them out of their environment. Um, traditional market research often looks for large target groups. It often looks at lumping people together and being able to run statistics on it. And we don't do that. We focus very much on the individual. We learn a lot from the extremes, which I'll be talking about later on. Um, and then last, um, traditional market research is very much about employing more objective analysis. It's about being able to run statistics on things. Um, it's about being able to crunch numbers. And often you'll see these very large surveys carried out by the private companies. Um, human practice research is only about engaging the designers and getting them um, basically empathy for the field of topic uh, and the people we are designing for. So, some techniques. There are loads of techniques. Um, we tend to put them up, up on this uh, kind of two by two, as we call it, where we have two spectrums, like one that goes from from the individual to the culture. Um, and the other one goes from looking inside, which is looking at the very much the product itself and the industry itself, to looking outside, which is looking at um, analogous yeah, industries or topics that might be related but not necessarily the same. Um, some examples put up here, you don't have to be able to read them. Um, and don't ask me why there's nothing in the middle. This was created by a graphic designer, and I just, I just changed it a bit. Um, they can probably be put in different places, and can probably discuss why they're where they are. But they are, it is a good, good list of things um, that you can do, and I'll just pick a few. So you can, for instance, look at brand, or you can look at the organizational structure to come. You can need to learn something about a certain topic, or you can Go down and you can look at people, you can look at users, you can look at 
it's right stakeholders. You can do it yourself if you have uh, experience with the product. It's not illegal to do it yourself, um, but it, it quite often is um, taught by the science schools that it is illegal looking at yourself, but it's not if you have experience. And we do that, um, but we also look at users. We always look at users. We look at extreme users. We look at um, experts. We look at people who do things that are related to something, but not the same. Um, and we also look at history, we look at media, we look at red and what we've done. Um, and I picked three, my three favorites. Um, the first, these are the three favorites that I think you might be able to do, um, do some, some of your insights with as well, especially if you, have, if you have a shorter project or if you don't have much time together or if you don't have many resources to, to plan. These are three good uh, methods. Um, the first one is observation, which is it's pretty straightforward. It's basically just looking at people, noticing behavior, evidence of behavior, and understanding why it's happening, asking yourself the right questions. Um, it's about noticing all the thoughtless little acts that people do. And one example of that is uh, here at a train station where um, both in the US and also in the UK and many other company, uh, countries, um, trash cans have disappeared from public places, stations, and so on, because of the risk of people hiding a bomb. So when people get off the train and they have their, their cups of coffee or whatever they have, they need somewhere to put them. They need to get rid of them. And uh, they end up at places like this, um, by the stairs. So what does that tell me? I don't know. Maybe it tells me that there is a need for a cup that you can actually fold and put in your pocket or your bag without ripping coffee in it, so you can dispose of it later. Maybe it tells me that there could be a need for, for a place in the market for a trash can that's bomb proof, so you can actually have trash cans in stations. Or maybe it tells me that there is a need for a sign that tells people that there is a trash can about 30 meters down the stairs. I don't know. Um, another example, and this is an example from, uh, from the UK where we visited uh, different people and we were talking to them about computer use and, and things. And um, we noticed that this person had this very nice system set up with like, a plug ball on the wall and plugs, and they all had labels on them. And Again, what does it tell me? Maybe it tells me that there is, there is a need for this person to have a system for organizing his or her cables. Because um, obviously there must be a reason that the person has put these, these labels on them. Or maybe it tells me that this person actually has a need for being able to unplug certain devices or to switch off certain devices without unplugging all the other ones. Or maybe it tells me that this person has invented a great product and we could actually just develop that a bit further and start setting labels for uh, the plugs. I don't know. Again, it's, it's observation and it's up to interpretation and of course it depends on what project you're working on. Now I'm going to try to experiment. I'm going to try and switch to video and see if you can see this. Right, so what you saw here, I hope you saw it. Um, that's basically some people who are very confused and they had no idea what to do after it was the right way into the museum. But apparently it wasn't because that was where people came out. And um, yeah, again, that showed a very basic and fundamental design flaw in the design of the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. People had no idea how to actually get in there. Um, so of course that was one of the things we addressed in the design of the lobby. Another good thing. Learning from the extremes, and that's one of my favorites, because that's usually quite fun. Um, we interview people, and we all, of course we talk to normal users of products, but we always try to find edge cases as well, people who are a little bit on the fringe. And um, we do that because that gives us a glimpse of the emerging behaviors, but also because the extremes are magnifying the size present in mainstream. So um, on a project around beauty care, we um, we decided to, to interview some people who had like, 
basically one extreme, someone who's using a lot of beauty products and someone who's denying any products. This person is seen here, I'm not quite sure um, how to describe her, but she had a very special relationship with makeup and, and beauty care products, and she basically, I don't know if your projector will show it, but she does work two different shades of lipstick, one on the inner parts of the lips and one on the upper parts, and I don't know what the, the dots about her eyebrows are, but basically this person is using a lot of makeup, spending a lot of time every day, um, always changing her appearance, and she had very specific requirements to beauty care products, especially with products, of course, around removing makeup, but also with makeup itself. Um, but the project is not just about makeup, it's just generally about personal care. So we also decided to, to, um, to look at the other end of the scale. We interviewed this guy who's a forklift driver. Um, he works in a construction site. He is, as he describes himself, he's this very bare-bones, basic, no-frills guy. He uses one brand of soap and that's it. Um, and I'm going to try and get Again, I can show you a bit of video from, um, from our interviews with him. So what you saw here was a guy who basically, he never identified himself as a person who's using beauty care products. As he says, he only has one type of soap. But then, because we're at his home, one of the interviewers is noticing that he has this food spot by his couch and asks him about it and that's where the whole story around him basically getting good baths and he's getting pedicures because he cares about what his feet look like and sandals and he has to put cream and things like that. So again that's super interesting because that shows that there is maybe a market somewhere for people who who are not people who would buy beauty care products and they don't see themselves as people who do, but actually they do. Um, so maybe there's a whole opportunity for creating products for people who, who wouldn't buy beauty care products. And of course that would be a marketing challenge, um, actually marketing products to people like that without calling beauty care, without um, letting people know that it is beauty care products. Again, always interesting talking to the extremes. The last one, now that is inspiration, um, which is also a really good one. Um, that is, and I mentioned it a bit earlier, it's basically the, the practice of looking at things that are related to what you're doing, but are not the same. And it's looking to, say, other industries who might have the same challenges, but they have found solutions to them. And one of the classic audio examples here is uh, we were doing a, product, a project with um, a medical institution and we were especially looking at how the workflows were happening in the operating theaters where you have doctors and nurses and surgeons and, and you have a lot of people going in and out and they're all working under a very um, critical time pressure and there's not really any room for mistakes in here. And the design team decided to, to look at, okay, where can we get inspiration on this? What other industries have the same constraints where time is super important and there has to be a very specific flow to the way you work, you can't make mistakes. So the team went out and they, they basically went to the racetrack and they looked at how kit crews, they work and how their workflows are structured. And what they saw then was that people were extremely specialized. They had very specific tasks. And one of the most important things was that there was one guy whose only job was to keep track of who was doing what and when so that he made sure everything happened in the right sequence. He would make sure that no one would lower the car before the wheels were, were securely fastened. He would make sure that, of course, the driver wouldn't go away with uh, without having the fuel pump removed and things like that. Um, so what they saw here was that these people were very, very structured in the way they work and they had this guy. So they went back to the hospital and said maybe we could learn something from this. And um, they basically, together with the staff at the hospital, they changed some, some rules around um, 
some some certain people's roles, and they basically got this guy who, who could give the thumbs up or thumbs down um, on certain certain procedures in the, in the whole operation. And again, they got uh, lower error rates, and they got more efficient workflow out of it by looking at analogous industries. Another example, which is more straightforward, um, it's a couple of years old now, it's quite, it's quite, quite old actually. Um, we were doing a project with a bank, an art bank, and they had this issue that they had a lot of products, but all these financial products or financial services were not really tangible. People couldn't really see them, and people wouldn't really discover them. Um, and they didn't really know what to do about that. They had branches that usually just be, as you know, in all the bank branch, you walk in, there will be tables and there will be bankers and people you can speak to about certain things. Um, and basically what the team did, they took some of the, the clients, the people from the bank as well with them, and they looked at how do people have physical products, how do they sell them? And everybody knows that, everybody's seen that. Um, because we all go to shops, but it wasn't until they actually did it with a purpose that they saw that, well, maybe we can we can show the bank products in the same way. Maybe we can make physical instantiations of, of these basically virtual products. So they did that, they made little boxes and little uh, booklets and magazines and things, and, and they got them out as you can see in the photo. They redesigned the whole branch, they got a much more airy layout, they, um, they basically moved all the bankers' desks and all the bankers away into a separate department where they could kind of go in and have this kind of meetings with people without other people being around. It would feel more um, private in a way. And the bankers would be more like sales folks in the in the shop, and they would be helping people out. They would be showing them around. They would be taking to the information kiosks and, and things like that. So it wouldn't feel like a bank anymore, it would feel more like going to a shop. And that was a huge success among the clients and um, the bank's customers. And what happened was that we saw other banks doing the same pretty shortly after. So those are my three favorite methods for getting insight. I think my, my time is slowly running out, but I want to go through some tips from the field as well. Where you've probably heard some of them before, but one of the most important things is that you are open and you stay curious. Be open means that don't, don't have your opinions, leave them behind, go out and just kind of be stupid. Um, and that's what I mean by being curious. Don't be afraid of asking stupid questions. Um, because that's perfectly that's fine. Actually, you should ask stupid questions. Because even though you think you might know the answer to something, you don't really feel the need for asking it, the person you're asking might have something to add about it. Or he might think that he knows, but he might not, and that will give you some insight as well. Um, so definitely just ask questions constantly. Constantly ask why, how, can you show me that, can you show me around, things like that. Be a little bit annoying, like a child like that. Um, and I mentioned this before, always try to meet people in their own environments. Try and go to their homes, um, try and go to the workplace. If you're designing, say you're designing a, a mobile app to help people do shopping, go shopping with them. See how they shop, go through the till, then help them build their cars and so on. Just meet people where they are and where they do the things that they normally do. And when you do that, it's very important to be polite and respectful because you're, you're crossing people's boundaries, especially when you go into their homes. Um, always be at your best behavior. That goes without saying. And, um, and be respectful about people's, uh, people's time. Don't show up late and things like that. Um, one should think that it would be necessary to say that, but it still happens even at IDEO. Um, and when you go out, team up with a buddy. Um, don't go alone, because if you go alone, you'll end up having to talk to the person, you'll have to take notes, you'll have to take photos, you'll have to observe, and you can't do all of that at the same time. So it's better to have at least two people, I would say two to three people is the best team size, um, and have specific rules and roles, sorry, 
Um, have someone who is the person who's talking and doing the conversation and kind of building this short-term relationship with the person you're interviewing and um, have another one taking notes, have another one observing, maybe sketching or something like that. Um, and also when you go out and try and take lots of photos, don't worry about the quality of the photos. You're not taking photos to have nice photos. Um, it's perfectly fine with blurry and low resolution and you're not getting the full, I don't know, you're taking a photo of. Um, make sure you've got the of people, but don't worry about qualities otherwise. It's only, you're only taking photos to document and to remind yourself when you get back what it was that you saw. And then, when, once you open the conversation, open up the warm-up questions. So, because you're still getting to know the person that you're interviewing, so you don't want to start to go on. You want to start talking about, say, if we're talking to someone about um, the experience of renting a car. Ask the person um, what was their best service experience, what was their worst service experience, and why was it so bad. Talk about things that people like talking about. And then once people have warmed up a bit, you can start going deep on in certain areas. And once you do that, then remember that pause is like a friend. Um, those little awkward moments where nobody is saying anything, those are some of the best ones because that means that, of course, you think it's awkward, but the person you're interviewing thinks it's equally awkward. So if you just shout out of the way, this person might say something that they originally intended not to say. So Say they've been thinking about something that they think sounds embarrassing, or maybe they don't feel that it's important, or something like that. If you get to these moments of silence, their brains will be running like crazy to find something to say, and they will eventually say some of those things that they're trying to go back. So pauses are good. And um, the last one is no one to stop. So sometimes you might get caught up on something, and you might want to keep investigating some area. If you feel the person is getting a bit nervous or anxious or annoyed with it, stop. Um, it's again goes back to, to being respectful as well. But also, know to stop when it comes to time. If you promise someone and it takes 45 minutes, then don't spend more than 45 minutes unless you really, really feel it's important. Then ask them and ask them multiple times. And then maybe if they say, okay, you can go ahead. So, one of my last slides here. The HFers Toolkit. HFers are an idea of people who deal with human factors. So those, those are people who are specialized in basically gathering insights. And um, some of the tools they use are here in this, in this blue photo. Um, the most important thing is, of course, the sketchbook. Don't forget the sketchbook. And related to that, there's a Sharpie right next to it. That's a, that's a kind of a felt tip pen. And then post-its on the other side of the image. Those go really well together because sometimes when you're going back, say you're going back on a train or something like that, you can start writing quotes down on the post-its, write them big so everybody can read them, so you can post them on the wall when you get back. And once you've all gone through your notes and taken out all the important quotes, put them on the wall, you can start sorting through them and start grouping them and see what other topics that we can look at. Um, where are some opportunity areas and where can we ask some really interesting questions that can break things down? Right? So, post-its and chapters are important. That is the next step after we do the user research usually. We get everything up on post-its so people can read it on top. Um, tools, of course a camera. And again, don't bring, don't bring a large SLR camera. Don't bring a large video camera or something. Take something discreet, like use your mobile phone, use a small pocket camera like you're seeing here, use a flip camera if you're doing video or something like that. Um, try to be discreet about the products you're using. You don't want to intimidate people with something big. Um, some people use dictaphones. I don't use dictaphones. I, I prefer not to because often when I use them, I end up having to transcribe things and that takes pages. So instead I rely on taking good notes. Um, but some people like the, the accuracy of the taste of 
Um, sometimes, especially later on in the project where we kind of know what we're designing, we bring prototyping materials, this really rough prototyping materials, so like tape, hard wallpaper, pipe cleaners, clay or something like that. And we we build prototyping with the people we're interviewing. So say we're uh, be designing a mobile app, we start throwing things out on paper and people can kind of try them out and discuss them as we're doing it. We're doing these prototypes, we call them sacrificial prototypes, but we're only creating them so that we can kill them with the user and get some feedback on them. Um, so don't get too precious and spend too much time building prototypes when we get to that stage. And then the last thing is, and that's something we've been, uh, we've started doing more recently, is to embrace microblogging. And we don't use Twitter as much, but some people do in other um, companies, but we use Tumblr or Postgre where we have these little blogs that we can password protect. And the good thing about them is that everybody on the team pretty much has a smartphone nowadays. And you can get apps for these smartphones, and basically what you can do is when you see something interesting, you can send a photo, jot down a few notes, and you can post it to the blog. So here's an example from that something I posted about half a year ago on a project, and I was doing a project um, that was about eating in small places and um, in strange places. And um, I was on a train home in London and I saw this guy eating his dinner on the tube and he was holding the tray with one hand and eating with the chopsticks in the other hand and decided to sneak closer to him and take a photo and post it to the blog. And that's the thing that blogs are great for. Because um, if you don't have things like that, you might take a photo, but you probably don't really, you won't get around to printing it and putting it on the wall and telling people about it. And that's all. Thank you for listening. And I'll be taking questions. Well, Tobias, uh, thank you very much for that. That was uh, very inspiring. Uh, I've I, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, perfect. So um, <clears throat> we've got a little over time, so uh, what I propose is that we do two or three quick questions uh, and then uh, mm -hmm. we uh, go to a break and, uh, and end it there. Is that fine by you? Okay, fine. And you can, you can email me questions if you want and I'll get back to you as well. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, so uh, from the class, uh, as I said earlier, the idea is that if you have any questions, you put up your hand and you can come down and uh, ask to be us in, in person. So, any questions uh, from the class? Yeah, there's one you probably can't see out here on the left. <laughs> one second. Hi, Tobias. Hey. Um, I'm just wondering, what, what kind of techniques did you use in the San Francisco Museum to make it more um, user-friendly at the end of the day? Um, what, are you thinking of specific designs or? Yeah, I mean, just to direct people. I mean, what what did you, is it just signage, or did you redesign the whole architecture of the place? In the beginning, we just we just what I'm saying, but we didn't criticize them. Um, actually, we we did re, we ended up redesigning the whole space so that it was kind of giving you sort of a natural flow. You can kind of see which way to walk. Um, what you saw when you saw those ticket things from the top, whether well, they had this rounding that made them look a bit like a funnel where people were supposed to walk through, but actually they were not supposed to walk through. So some that was one of the things that we, we got rid of. Does that answer the question? Yeah, no, thanks. Perfect, thank you for that. Any other questions? Well, I guess uh, I guess not. Uh, did you have anything, uh, Tom, anything you want to ask? Yeah. Hi, Tobias. Uh, can you hear me? Hey. Sorry. <laughs> you can never quite judge whether yeah, you can hear or not. Um, I was wondering whether there was something uh, unique about the, the nature of the projects you select, which makes you focus more on um, kind of uh, user orientated studies than market research. Um, is that something that IDEO focuses on? Maybe some of the projects that the students are working on here and more suitable to the market research dimension? 
That, that kind of was, yeah, we, we very often focus on doing projects that are not so market research heavy. Um, we do sometimes, we have very big corporations as clients and we do the market research almost for us, but they have other consultancies that, that do that with us. And, um, and we do what we call hybrid research, where we basically we combine qualitative and quantitative uh, research which is a, that's a, a, a long and very hairy topic that I won't get on because I don't know too much about it, but um, basically we do have projects that we, we use market research, but um, they're not, there aren't that many of them. Um, the main reasons that we do this kind of use of research is that it, it can be hard for designers who are working, usually typically we're, we're working on for like three months to work on a project and uh, it can be hard, hard to sort of empathize and, and emotionally connect with a project when you're only on it for a short time. So when you spend a week or two really investing in yourself, that's where you, you connect with things and you get more passionate about the work you do. So um, Tobias, I think uh, we'll leave it at that. I think uh, it's been... Uh, a great opportunity to listen to your inputs on this and I'm sure that everyone here can can use your inputs in the, the work they'll be doing in the, the rest of this course so thank you very much let's get give Tobias a hand once again